Today I'm going to be going over how to uh, determine the difference between a professional and institutional and a dental transaction and what elements make those different. I'm also going to be going over uh, a dependent subscriber scenario so you can uh, identify if you have a transaction in A37 that actually has a dependent loop in it. So with that said, let's go ahead and jump in. I'm going to be using the CAT claim adjudication system, which works the same as any other transaction processing or claim adjudication system out there on the market, uh, like, for example, for Medicare or Medicaid or Blue Cross or Commercial Plan. So let's start off by uh, ingesting or importing uh, a number of claims. So we've ingested this folder. And I think for example sake, I'm going to actually validate and adjudicate these claims, including building the remittance and the claim status. So we can look at that data as well. So with that said, let's take a look at the dental claim. You'll see at the top, at the end of the GS segment, that there's an element here that says 50.00.50.10x.224.82. Now, this first part here, the 5010x, is a prefix that you'll find standard in all 5010 uh, transactions for HIPAA. The next three letters are actually what tells you that this is a dental transaction, 224. These last two numbers are actually just an, an, an addenda ID. An addenda is, for example, a correction or an update. Uh, to that transaction. We found these in the 4010, they were in the 5010, and when the 7030 comes out, uh, it will probably be the same sort of scenario. Uh, a second place where you can identify if a transaction is dental is in the STL3, and you can see that transaction ID repeating uh, again in this transaction. Again, these last three letters right here show you that the 224, that's what you're seeing, that's actually a dental transaction. There's also a third location that you can look on a dental transaction, and that's right here at the 2400 loop. Uh, LX always starts with 1, uh, and it goes on from there. It'll be LX1, LX2, uh, LX3, and so on and so forth. But the uh, charges section, the charges uh, segment, has uh, a segment name of, of SV3. Now, that's unique to dental. Uh, there's a different segment ID used for uh, institutional and professional, but for dental, it will say SV3. There is one other point I want to show you with this transaction, and that is the charges. They're in the second element. In the professional transaction, you'll see the charges are also in the second element. Uh, in the institutional transaction, they're actually in the third, because uh, for dental and professional, you have a procedure code and then the charge amount, but for institutional, you'll have a revenue code and then a procedure, uh, then a possible procedure code or not. It's not mandatory, it's optional. And then the third element in institutional is going to be the charge. So that's the three areas that you can uh, look at if you wanted to determine if you have a dental transaction. Let's take a look at this professional transaction and see what it looks like. You'll note that in this last element in the GS segment, it also has this transaction ID. This one uses 222. That means it's professional. Again, in the ST03, you can see uh, that it uses that extension of 222. Now I'm going to scroll down here and show you. Okay, I've got a note here. Uh, the CAT claim adjudication system will also give you some pointers. This one is telling me that there's a non-specific uh, CPT code uh, without a description. So. Uh, the CAT system will also let you, uh, in some cases, it will help you out with some of your analysis, uh, and it will help you find errors in some cases. So um, the 2400 loop here says LX1, and notice that the segment name is SV1. Now the dental had SV3, professional has SV1, and the charge, like the dental, is in the second element. Uh, for this particular transaction, uh, there's a scenario where there's actually a dependent, so I'm going to go over that. Uh, this transaction, if you look at it, uh, you see the 1000A loop and the 1000B loop, and then you have your 2010AA uh, billing provider loop. Notice this hierarchical loop here. This is the 2000A loop. Nested inside of that is the 2010AA, which has your billing provider. Uh, and the you could also have an NN185, which would have a pay to address, and then a subrogation in uh, 2010AC. Uh, in this uh, particular transaction, we only have the 2010AA loop, which will show you um, the billing provider's name and uh, demographics. If you go on from there, you'll find the, tw the 2000B loop. And you'll notice here that in HL04, there's a 1. Normally, it's a 0, which means the subscriber is, um, is actually the patient. But if you have a scenario where, for example, dad has the insurance, and then uh, maybe mom and child are dependents, uh, and, and they are one of those two are, are the patient, then you're going to have a dependent scenario. So let's go over what that would look like. So the first thing in the 2000B loop, you see 1. And then uh, you have your 2010 BA loop, which shows your subscriber. Notice that there's no... Uh, N3 and N4 address segments here. They're mandatory unless the patient is not uh, the subscriber. And in this case, there's a dependent. So you're not allowed to have those address information. So here you have your 2010BB with the payer, and this is the loop that we're talking about right here. The 2010CA loop, which has your dependent. Notice that this qualifier says NN1QC. So you have billing provider, NN1A5. Then you have your subscriber, NN1IL, your payer, NN1PR, and then your dependent, NN1QC. And that is how you identify if you have a dependent transaction. Uh, pretty much the rest of those transactions are the same. I, w I will point out uh, that 
in some scenarios where you have a COB claim, a COB transaction, uh, you can have an other payer section, which is really similar to having a claim inside of a claim. Uh, if you're dealing with another payer, they're going to adjudicate the claim. They're going to tell you who the other subscriber was. They're going to tell you who the other payer was. They're going to show you uh, the payments and adjustments as well. Uh, and this one has that scenario as well. I, I'm not going to dig too deeply into that, but I just wanted to make sure that you understood that we're in the 2320 loop now, which begins right here at the SBR segment. And notice that there's an in one IL. So, so make sure that you're in the right loop because this right here is not the 2010BV loop. It's actually the 2330A. And this is the 2320, and there's your 2330B. So that's just a quick note to help you out. I, I'm mentioning that there. Uh, this is probably a good place to stop there because I could do a whole video on COB claims, and I could do another video on balancing. Uh, if you have interest, uh, leave me a comment, if you would, or drop me an email. Um, I, I think this is probably a good place where uh, you know I, I can start putting up some bigger classes for how to go over building your data or uh, debugging your data. But this, this is a good overview. So let's look at the institutional claim now, and we'll make this quick. Um, You'll notice that at the end of this GS segment uh, that you have the same prefix as before, 5010 you know, X, and then here the next three letters are 223. Now that means that it's a uh, institutional claim, and the same with SDL3 that we had looked at before. And the third place where you can find or identify an institutional transaction is in the charges section, 2400 loop. It uses an SV2. So to recap quickly, SV1 is professional, SV2 is institutional, and SV3 is dental. And uh, the charges are in the second element, except if you're talking about uh, an institutional claim. The charges are actually in the third element, right there. I'm sorry, I mean SVD loop. I'll make a little correction right there. I don't know if you can see this, but this is where uh, you might have, for example, uh, a CPT code. It's optional. So you can see that there's an SV201, which is a revenue code, an SV. 202, which is a procedure code, which is, is optional for institutional, and then the third element is actually the charge. Again, on this institutional claim, there was no CPT. I just put that there so you could have something for reference. Uh, so that is how you identify those transactions. Let's take a look uh, real quick at uh, the related 835 and 277 CA for these. I'm going to pull up the GUI on these and, and uh, process them, and we'll notice that there's a CLP segment. That's where your payment goes. In CLP 03, 1, 2, 3 is the amount charged. And CLP04 is the amount paid. Uh, I want to show you also that on the 835, the 835 transaction is the only HIPAA transaction that does not have uh, a transaction identifier. This is typically an outbound transaction, which is probably why they didn't include it, which is also why they included that transaction. Uh, a lot of payers were stripping off the envelope, the IS and GS segments, and when they came to the ST, this is what 4010 was like. Uh, it didn't have the identifier, so uh, a lot of these programmers or developers needed some kind of help, so they, they put the transaction ID in there uh, at the top of the claim. So that's very helpful there. Let's look at, uh, for example, a professional now. And the reason why I'm showing you these is to let you see that the transactions are coming out differently, uh, but they're still using the same 835 to process uh, these transactions on the outbound. CLP you know, 3 and 4 has the ch amount charged and the amount paid. Okay. And we can look at an institutional, and, and it's pretty much the same way. Okay. CLP and amount charged and amount paid. Let's take a quick peek at uh, claim status. Um, and this is really just to give you a well-rounded view of what uh, these transactions would look like um, in an adjudication scenario. So you get to look at the data for institutional and professional and dental, and you get to look at, for example, uh, what the remittance looks like for each of those and the claim status. Uh, this claim status transaction, I could probably do it in another video in that. If you're interested, drop me a comment below, or even better yet, send me an email and make a request, uh, and I can certainly set something up for you. Uh, when you look at uh, a 277CA, which, by the way, is not formatted the same as a 277. Okay, so make note of that. Just because one says 277, it's actually formatted a little bit different than a 277 CA. Uh, the 277 was originally set up as a request response. You have a 276 claim status request from a doctor, a hospital, a provider, if you will, and then the payer would send back a 277. Uh, in scenarios where payers wanted certain information to be provided as a response back to submitted claims, a lot of payers will automatically produce this 277 CA, or a transaction company, a technical vendor, might do the same. Uh, a tricky part about looking at these 277 CAs is don't stop at the first SDC. That's where your status is. You have to find this hierarchical loop here that has a PT in the third element. One, two, three. Okay. After that, you can find the status uh, of your claim and charge line. And here we have an A2 and a 20, which means that this transaction has been accepted, and, and that gives you the status there. So this is a brief overview of what uh, the transaction processing will look like uh, in, um, in a standard scenario. Uh, again, I've used the uh, CAT claim adjudication system, but no matter what you're using or whatever uh, claim processing system or adjudication software that you're using, it's pretty much going to be the same sort of process. Um, 
if you have any other questions, for example, um, you can find me here uh, at edi.dallas. Uh, you can also drop me a comment. I appreciate you watching my video, and uh, you know, subscribe or give me a like if uh, you'd like to know, have uh, more information. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks. Thank you.